Okay, let's start um, again. So, uh, what I'm going to do in this second lecture is showing you another example of a structure that um, you can reason about using co induction. And um, again, Frank already uh, introduced part of the things I'm going to do um, by mentioning automata. And so, the whole lecture, or at least Two-thirds of it is going to be about um, automata and languages and the co-induction principle for, um, for those. And then what we're going to do tomorrow, maybe not tomorrow, but Wednesday, we're going to see that both the stream example and the automata example actually fit under a very general um, umbrella. And using category theory, I'm going to show you how to derive new co-induction principles and new bi-simulation definitions for other data types. Um, OK, so let's start um, by setting some uh, terminology and some uh, notation. Uh, Marco, can you read? Okay, good. I'm going to try to keep the font size as I go. Um, <clears throat> okay, so for um, the purposes of uh, my lectures, I'm going to consider automata without mentioning their initial state. So the only thing I'm going to have in my definition, I'm going to have a deterministic automaton is a pair containing a set of states x and then I have <clears throat> a function um, that is an output function into um, the set two, which really is um, just the two elements set with zero, one. And I'm going to say that um, a state is final if the output is one, and is non-final if the output is zero. And the transition function that takes a state and takes an input letter from the alphabet and gives me a next state. So this is the next state function. So a couple of um, remarks. So an automaton is um, defined over an alphabet A. So that's a parameter of the, um, of the definition. And typically, you will see um, an automaton has, comes equipped not with an output function, but with a subset of um, final states, f in s. Um, but that is equivalent to say that you take the characteristic function of f, which is, goes from s to 2. And that's what I'm using in, in my definition. So I'm taking um, in the definition immediately just this output function in 0, 1. But it is equivalent to the classical definition um, that has a subset of final states. Um, the transition function is, in many books, written like this. You take a, a state and a letter, and then you give me the next state. Again, I'm choosing just to uh, anchor this function and look at it like this, but it is totally 
equivalent. Okay? And the only thing I'm omitting, as I said, is the initial state, um, because I'm going to be talking about um, the languages that a certain state accepts without thinking about um, just the initial state. OK. So automata are um, structures that accept languages. And you remember in the first part of the, um, the lecture, I showed you that A star, the words over A, are an inductive data type. Um, and it so happens that languages, which are just subsets of words, are a co-inductive data type. So this, this interplay between induction and co-induction um, appears in many places in, in theory um, of computation and, and PL. Um, so we're going to define uh, now when a word is accepted by an automaton. Uh, by a state of an automaton. And then the language of the automaton is every word that that state um, accepts. So let's say A um, So a word is accepted by um, a state if one of two things is true. Either the word is the empty word, and the state is final, or the word has a letter and continues with some other word, and then U is accepted by the state that you can reach by reading A from S. There is um, another way to, um, to, define, to define this, namely the function t, which as I said can be written in this way. This function has a natural inductive extension to words, namely, you can define t of s of the empty word to just be s, so you just don't move. And you can define t of s of au. Probably my font size is getting smaller now, sorry, um, to be t of uh, let's give this a different name, just the toy or clear. So you can define this inductive extension of T to words, and then you can say that the word W is accepted. by S if and only if T hat of S of W is an accepting state. So O of that is 1. Okay. So it's, I mean, it's just the same definition. But 
But if I have this t hat, then it's slightly easier to write, um, given a state s, the language of the state s is just then all the words in A star such that the word is accepted. Okay? So let's do an example. Um, so I'm going to write I'm going to write double circles for states that are accepting and single circles for states that are um, not accepting. So let's, for instance, do this one. So let's take the alphabet AB. An automaton. Oh, it's just names. So I'm taking S to be S0 and S1. So I'm writing the names on the states. Yes. Thank you. So this uh, diagram just represents the function. O of S0 is 0, O of S1 is 1, and then T of S0 of A is S1, T of S0 of B is S0, T of S1 of A is S0, and T of S1 of B is S1. One. Okay, so this is just sort of a pictorial representation of these two functions. <clears throat> so, uh, what words does this automaton accept, or this, let's say, state S0? Did I use a small L? So, I, what can I do in S0? I can read bunch of Bs, and then at some point I'll read an A, and I go to S1, and that is accepted. But if I read the second A, then I come back to S0, that is non-accepting. If I read here multiple Bs, I remain in S1, so it is accepting. Um, so what do the words that this automata accept have in common? I mean, we can write a few. Um, a is accepted, BBA is accepted, BBAB is accepted. An yeah, an odd number of A's. B is not accepted. Um, an odd number of A's is accepted. So it's all words in a star such that the number of um, A's is odd. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Let's just do one more example. So. Uh, can we draw an automaton that accepts all words such that the number of Bs is a multiple of three? I'll give you a minute or so to think about it. The question is, can we draw an automaton 
that accepts all words over the alphabet AB that have a, the number of P's is a multiple of three. Okay, does anyone have the answer? Oh, I see what you mean. So, um, let's do it without, without zero, and then the picture is. Okay. So, this is one, um, one solution. Does anyone have a different solution? Did everyone come up with the same solution? OK. Um, I was hoping there would be multiple solutions. Um, <clears throat> this, is, this is the um, obvious solution, I agree. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I could be in a different mood and come up with a different solution, namely, um, Probably this is going to go wrong, and I'm going to write the wrong solution, but bear with me for a second. Um, This solution is wrong, by the way. Now that I look at it, OK, yeah, why is it wrong? I mean, I, probably I drew the wrong thing that you said. I didn't draw what you said. What does this accept? Yeah, it does not accept the multiples of three. Wait, uh, what if you start in that state? Then you're good. Oh, OK, I thought we were starting. <laughs> Good point. OK, let's, uh, let's write an S there so that we know we're starting there. OK, um, who thinks this automaton is correct as well? It probably is not, but uh, since I just did it now on the fly. Um, is that a solution to the same problem? Hopefully, it is a solution. Uh, if I copied it right, um, because what I, the only thing I did was to copy the states and to have copies of the same states going around. And somehow, if you stare at it long enough, you convince yourself that this should be doing the same thing, because you just have two copies of the same automaton, and they are connected. And therefore, if I accept, um, if I accept here by going once around it, I will 
sorry, by going twice around it, I will accept there just by going once around it, but it should still give me the exact same words. Um, now, how do I now show this, actually? So how do I get a formal proof that, in fact, these two states here accept the same language? So what, by similarity, indeed. Um, so one thing one could try, if you look at the definition of language and the, the way we define t hat, you could try to do it by induction on the length of words. Right? You, could, you could try to show, by induction on the length of words, that every word that is accepted in this automaton will also be accepted in that automaton. And again, we're in a similar place as we were with strings. You might be able to do a few proofs in that way, but you very quickly get to a point where you realize that automata, very much similarly to strings, have this circular nature. And even though these are um, gadgets that accept finite words, the languages they accept are infinite because you can go you know, you can, you can do, um, the words that you accept are finite, but you can do as many these as you want as long as they are multiples of three, right? So this, the collection of words they accept are not finite. And they have the circular structure given um, by the automaton transition that we, we see here depicted uh, on the board. And that's where co-induction plays, uh, plays a role. So what we're going to do next, I'm going to, show you how to define a notion of bisimulation for automata. And then I'm going to show you, again, a co-induction proof principle that says, if you have a bisimulation, then the two states accept um, the same language. And then basically, um, I'm going to show you the proof that these two automata accept the same thing. And the proof is going to consist of a, um, oops not a good color, uh, of a relation like before, of a relation, but this time over the state spaces of this um, automata. And in the case of these two, I'm just going to give you um, the solution now, and then we're going to verify it. What's going to happen is you're going to link the states in the following way. So you're going to link these two states, and then all its successors get linked. Um, so this guy gets linked with that guy, and this guy gets linked with that guy. And then we go around. So uh, we're back to that, that gets linked to that, and that gets linked to that, and that gets linked to that. And so the, um, the red links on the board give you the definition of a binary relation that relates the states of this automaton with the states of this automaton. And I'm going to show you why having that relation actually shows that this um, automata accept the same language, that these two states accept the same language. And in fact, any two states related here will accept the same, um, the same language. Okay. Uh, I'm considering that these two things are two different automata. And so this is defined over S, S you know, okay. these three states, and T is these six states. It's just the state space. Okay, so let's do that now. So a relation, so given two automata S and T a relation R is a bisimulation
if for all pairs two things happen, O of S equals O prime of T. So this says S is final in one automaton if and only if T is final in the other. Or in other words, the S accepts the empty word if and only if T accepts the empty word. And then T of S of A for all A is related to T prime. Oh, I should not have used T as a letter. Sorry. Yeah. Let's use um, X and Y just to make And so if I take a step in one automaton with letter A, and I take a step with letter A in the other automaton, then those states that I reach should also be related. Okay. Little A is over the alphabet. Is over the alphabet A. So I'm assuming the automata are over the same alphabet. And then the co-induction proof principle for this um, automata says that S is by similar, oh, let's not use S and T again that x is bisimilar to y implies that the language of x equals to the language of y. Okay, and again I'm using this symbol to say there exists there exists a bisimulation that relates states x and y. One way is that you have two simulations, one in each direction, and I think that's how the word by simulation might have come. But this is my, my guess. Um, so for many types, but not all, a by simulation is equivalent to um, having simulations in both directions, but that's not always the case. Okay, so let's just quickly um, check that that relation um, I have there on the board actually is a bisimulation according, um, according to this definition. And um, I am not planning to show you the proof of this unless uh, someone very urgently wants to see it uh, because it follows the very similar structure to the stream one. It's basically just going to be by induction on the length of the words, um, but it's a very similar pattern. And 
The reason why it is a very similar pattern is that you can think of streams in some ways as automata over the one letter alphabet. And that's why a lot of the things you're seeing now look pretty much the same as, as before. So the stream case is in fact um, an instance of this case if you allow the outputs to be more than zero and, and one. So bit streams are definitely an instance of this. And um, the types are very, very similar. And so tomorrow, um, I'll show you the proof of the co-induction principle for general, for more general types that cover all of this. So uh, unless someone is dying to see this proof, um, then I would continue. I mean, I'm happy to do it if people want, but uh, if not, um, let's do uh, just the example over there for this definition, and then I'm going to argue that um, we can improve a little bit on this definition to have more efficient um, proof method. OK, so just quickly on this example. So let's number the states, just to be a bit easier. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So the relation there would be um, <clears throat> one with four, two with five, three with six, and then one with seven, two with eight, and three with nine. Okay. And so now we check, the first thing we do, we just check if, they, if all their outputs are the same. Uh, and you can easily see that 1 and uh, 4 and 1 and 7 are the only pairs in here that are um, final, and all the others are non-final. So on the output side of things, there's no problem. And so now we just check. Uh, what happens for letters A and B. So for letter A, 1 goes to 2 and 4 goes to 5. And then 2, 5 goes to 3 and to 6, to 4 and to 7. There's no 4 here, so this actually goes back to 1. Um, and this goes to 2 and to 8, and to 3 and to 9. And then this goes to 1 and to 4. These are the A transitions of all these pairs. Do you agree? And now you can see that all these pairs are actually, I wrote them in the order that they show up. So every pair in that relation makes a transition to a pair that is there. And if you do the same thing with the Bs now, well, the Bs, because they are self, <coughs> sorry, they are self loops, they all stay in the same place. So for the Bs, I really um, have nothing to check because they all just self loop. So this relation is um, a bisimulation, and it therefore tells you that all these pairs are states that accept the same language. OK, now let's imagine that I made a mistake and that I um, forgot to put an accepting on state 7. And I'm still trying to check whether it's a bisimulation. So what I would do, I would start with these pairs, right? And then when I get um, to 1 and 7, I would have a problem because, in fact, O of 1 is different from O of 7. Because now O of 1 is 1, 
and O of 7 is 0. So at this stage, depending which, um, which state is my target state, let's say 1 is my target state and, and 4. So I'm comparing 1 and 4. That's why I'm doing this by simulation. So at this stage, I could basically backtrack on what I had looked at, and I could um, see that the word, the word B, 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 I swapped the Bs in my reasoning, and no one stopped me. Uh, it's great. Uh, every, is there, did everyone notice this, or uh, and no one said anything? That's uh, okay. Next time, do stop me. Um, okay, so the the word B B B is accepted by state one. But it is not accepted by state 4. So the fact that you're doing these checks one by one, and at some point you get a failure, the fact that you already have done the checks in order actually gives you an exact trace, a word that is accepted by, by the other. So that's another thing you get with these by simulations. You get ways of getting counterexamples to proofs. So if your proof works out, that's great, and the checks are very um, relatively simple. Uh, but if the proof doesn't work out because you know you made a mistake later in your automaton, or, or simply because the automata are not the same, then you can actually detect the mistake, and you can make it concrete in terms of a word that is accepted by one state, but not um, by the other. And um, this type of, I mean, this feature of by simulations can be um, exploited when you have automata describing, for instance, security protocols. And you might have one automaton quite small that um, someone drew, drew by hand and said, OK, this is what my protocol should be doing. And maybe you have another automaton that corresponds to an implementation that someone did of that protocol. And you can use both, so the one you think is the intended behavior and the one that you are actually running. And then you can use this technique to basically find potential um, flaws in the way the protocol was implemented. So you can use, say, the smaller automaton as a monitor, and then you can run, you can run by simulation checks on um, any updates on your implementation, and, and use that to detect uh, potential bugs in the code. Okay, now by simulation is um, great. But it also has some problems sometimes. And I would like to show you a little bit that. Um, are there questions up to here? By simulation of full fledged programs? Uh, depends what you mean by that. I mean, you can, the, I mean, the, the simple answer is no, because there's a lot of things going on in a full-fledged program, depending on the language. Um, but it's more complex than that, because sometimes you only care about certain parts of your program, right? Maybe you only care about um, one variable and the control flow on that variable. Or maybe you only care about um, a set of variables and, and what happens to certain changes, certain operations on those. And a lot of the times, those behaviors you can capture in a regular way. And therefore, you can use by simulation and even by simulation or automata on that. Um, but in general, no. More questions? Uh, 
so you mean by you mean um, that you would minimize both, and then you would look at the minimal one and see if it's isomorphic. Um, so one, yes, you're right. This one, if there's a problem, it will just highlight it immediately. So you don't need to like spend a lot of time minimizing both because maybe if the mistake is in you know second state, then this will trigger it immediately because you you just see the difference. Um, if they are the same, then a lot of bisimulation algorithms will be equivalent to minimizing and comparing. Um, so, so there's, a, there's actually a very close connection between minimization and bisimulation that I'll mention um, in the next lecture. Uh, but one thing, and this is related to what I'm going to show next, um, one thing about these bisimulation methods is um, that there are very easy ways to actually make them more efficient and to avoid having to check all the states. And uh, so I'll show this um, next. Okay, so here's an example um, of two automata over the one letter alphabet, so really simple, uh, where all states are accepting, meaning they actually accept any word. But somehow I decided to use an automaton with six states to um, to accept that. So I'm just, throw, I'm just throwing dots, just to be a bit quicker. But they all accept. And it's only over one word. So I'm not even going to bother to write the letter, sorry, over one letter. So I'm not going to bother to write the letter. Um, but so this is one automaton. And here's another one. Um, And if you look at them, and I tell you they are over one letter, and all the states are accepting, then you very quickly convince yourself um, that these are equivalent, right? So the, I'm thinking about the first state here. But how would we actually build a bisimulation to show that they are equivalent? OK, we would start with the first two states. And we would say, OK, my bi-simulation has to at least relate these two states. And then after I make a transition, it has to relate those two states. So those would be in the relation. And then you know, these two, and then these two, and then these two. And then at that stage, now let me see if I do this correctly, I go here. So I have to relate these two, and then I have to relate ooh, uh, these two, and then these two, and then these two, and then, and then it's madness. And then I have to relate <laughs> these two, OK? And then. Am I done? I'm not done yet. And then I have to relate these two. And then I have to relate these two and these two. And I'm not going to draw anymore, because by now you're not following, uh, because of all these red lines. But in essence, I've just drawn basically the worst case scenario, which is the transitions are nested in a way that you have to explore the whole state space. And this is not great, because <laughs> I mean, if you look at it for a little while, you realize that a lot of these pairs should not be needed. So which pairs, where could we have stopped in a reasonable uh, place that we would be convinced 
So we could also convince a computer to believe us that um, this was enough. So I'm going to delete the red thing again. Um, and then I'm going to draw it a second time. Uh, let's see if I can just delete the things that I don't need. Oh, I'm going to delete everything. It's too difficult. OK, so let's draw them again. So we have all of this, and that's kind of reasonable. And then um, I have those there. OK. And now at this stage, once I've drawn all of that, if you look at it the way I drew it as well, realize that in this graph, I have a connection between every possible pair of nodes. And so when I, um, when I draw the next step, which would be that and that, I'm going to draw it here so that you see. So when I draw that, when I add that pair to my bisimulation, if that pair were not bisimilar, then I would, have, I would have seen a counterexample by now. Because if you look at all the things I've added before, I would be saying, OK, if these two states are not bisimilar, then that means that those two are not bisimilar, which means that those two are not, and those two are not, and so on. So in fact, my bisimulation so far already tells me, by using this path here, let me see if I can draw this in another color, by using this path here, there's a clear path between the two states that I'm trying to add now. And that path should tell me that I don't need to yet check this new thing. And so this is a, um, so there's a way to formalize this, which I'll do next. Um, but this is a technique um, that goes back actually to um, Hopcroft and um, CARP. And um, it can be improved even, even further. And if I have time, I'll, I'll show you that. But basically, what we're going to be doing now, so it's, it's by simulation. But it's by simulation, and at the same time, we check if we haven't seen any <coughs> path that allows us to skip some checks. And in this case, would be by simulation up to um, equivalence. Because what we would be doing at every step, in some sense, is to look at the um, reflexive transitive closure of everything we already added and check if the pair, so if the new pair, so in, in the bisimulation definition, we check if the pair that we obtain by doing a transition is in the relation. But now what we are doing here, we're checking if the pair is not in the relation, but in fact is in the transitive closure of the relation. And if that is the case, then we're going to argue, and I'm going to write it down, that that's enough that you don't need to add it. And in this case, it would save us a whole bunch of um, pairs. And so um, the bisimulation check, in the worst case, can be quadratic in the um, state space of the automaton. And if you add this uh, enhancement to it, so if you um, avoid checking um, Sorry, if you do an extra check, so if you don't check only if the pair is in the relation, but it if, if it is in the reflexive transitive closure, uh, then the equivalence checking becomes n log n. And um, the neat thing that you can find in, in the original article by, by Hopcroft and Karp 
is that you can store this relation in a very smart data structure called union find that computes the reflexive transitive closure um, very efficiently. So that extra check is not adding complexity to your algorithm because you're using a, a data structure to store the relation in a way that this reflexive transitive closure comes almost for free. Uh, so the union find data structure is just a way of storing a relation that also stores extra pointers that tell you what the uh, reflexive transitive, transitive closure is. Okay, so let me just write down this um, definition and I'm going to prove correctness of it. So I'm going to show that if I have a bisimulation, sorry, if I have, I'm going to define what a bisimulation up to equivalence is and then I'm going to show that if I have such a thing, then it is also a bisimulation. Okay, so the setup is the same as before. We have two automata. And we're going to say that um, a relation is a bisimulation up to equivalence. If um, for all pairs we have the same thing as before, and I'm again using these letters that are So now we modify the um, definition to say that the transition is so that the states, you make a transition with the same letter, and now instead of being related by R, they are related by um, the reflexive transitive closure of R which I'm denoting by R star there. Okay, and then you have a co-induction principle that says that um, if there exists a bisimulation up to, and uh, let's write that like this with a star there, then the languages of the states are the same. And the proof um, is actually Yeah, thank you. Exactly. So that's the proof. That's what I was about to say. So the proof in this case is, um, is relatively simple because what, you, what one does is to basically show that if you start with R being a bisimulation up to, then this R star is actually a bisimulation and therefore from a smaller relation you can build a larger one that is a bisimulation and that witnesses the language equivalence and that's why this principle is correct. Um, but what is interesting is that this up to equivalence is not the only principle you can use to um, stop earlier. So there are other things 
are there up to techniques that one can use um, to build smaller and smaller relations? And um, this is something um, that if I have time in the last lecture, I might show you, um, but not, not today, um, because I, I need to introduce um, regular expressions, or maybe I can do that today. Let me think for a second. Um, no, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to um, to something a bit different now, and then we'll get back to um, up to techniques uh, once we have some uh, some more material. So what I would like to do for the last um, twenty minutes, twenty five minutes is to um, start showing you why these things work in general and how induction and co-induction are um, dual in a very uh, categorical uh, sense. But before I go on, any questions up to here? No? OK. So. Let me just clear the board. Okay, so what I would like to do now is to start looking at the following table and to start going through some of the things um, So we've seen uh, in the first lecture and in the first part of this lecture um, some examples of structures that can be considered algebraic because they are defined using induction and some things that are more co-algebraic um, in which the structure themselves might be defined uh, using co-induction and We've looked at by simulation as um, as a proof method for uh, co-induction. Now, this whole um, sort of duality between these two structures comes from uh, a categorical notion of something called initial algebras and final co-algebras. And um, both uh, these things are instances of fixed points. And that's why, that's how they are connected. One is a least fixed point the other one is a greatest fixed point. So since many of you are um, familiar with OCaml, um, and I guess some of you are also familiar with Haskell, um, in OCaml, when you write a data type, the um, default interpretation is the greatest fixed point interpretation. 
So when you define the data type for lists, that data type allows you to represent not only finite lists, but also infinite lists. So you can write things like let rec um, t equals cons uh, one t, right? This is, you can write this in OCaml, so you can actually represent, when you do data type for lists, it automatically assumes that you might also want to do infinite things. Um, however, if you do it, so the, the data type for lists in some uh, ways has what? Has a, a nil construct and then it has a cons construct that takes an element and another list. Right, so if I, um, let's call that L for a moment, and I'll explain these symbols in a second. But so the, um, the way um, OCaml tries to figure out the objects of that data type is by trying to solve an equation of this type. It's trying to build a data type L that is either, so the plus is giving you a choice, it's either nil or it has an element and then continues with some other list. Yes? Because I thought that it was in Haskell that all the data structures were lazy and possibly infinite, and in OCaml they were necessarily finite. Uh, no. no. Okay. I am not mixing it up. Uh, no, no, you, I mean, the, the difference is in uh, OCaml, you have, when you define an infinite list, if you then try to pass it as an argument to a function, you'll, you'll run into trouble because OCaml will try to evaluate that argument. Whereas in Haskell, Haskell doesn't care. And unless you try to use the list, it won't evaluate it. Uh, but the data type itself still contains all, you could still, uh, as I wrote with letrec, with letrec, you can still build the list, the infinite list of ones. If you pass it as an argument to a function, then you will be in trouble. But writing the infinite list of ones, you can. You can even define a function that gives you all the prefixes of the list of ones of a certain length. And OCaml will be perfectly happy with it. It won't complain at all. And in fact, and this, this is maybe um, something uh, for another lecture, but in, in OCaml, what is quite frustrating is the way letrec works, you can only define very simple infinite data structures. Namely, you can only define, uh, for instance, infinite lists that are ultimately periodic. Because the way you, you use letrec, the only thing you can do is letrec and then calls a finite number of times and then go back. Or maybe you can do, you know, the list 0101 by doing a mutually recursive function. But that's it. You cannot uh, very easily define anything that is not ultimately periodic. Uh, and still, you cannot operate on these things. Which, um, anyway, that's topic for maybe for another lecture on why OCaml, uh, I mean, OCaml, you can improve OCaml uh, very easily to be able to, to do things like that, um, but by default it doesn't. And I mean, it is because co-induction and, and co-inductive data types were, uh, in some sense, not considered uh, mainstream until recently. And now they are there, but the support for them is much, less mainstream than the support for algebraic data types. Um, no, the dual, that's why I, I kept induction here. So by simulation is just one way to talk about co-induction. So the dual here would be just proofs by induction. So when we showed this morning, so induction, this morning we used um, induction to define the function length, for instance, and then we used the induction to prove properties about the function. Uh, and if you want to prove that two um, lists are equal, you'll probably do it by induction on their length. 
Uh, and so I just wrote by simulation here. I'm, maybe I should put this between brackets. So co-induction is the principle, and by simulation is just one way to, um, to do co-induction. So, um, so I, what I would like to do now is to show you the definitions of initial and, and final, and show you how from that definition you actually get induction and co-induction for a very general um, class of, of data types, including lists. And um, just uh, to say that for this data type, if we would look at the initial algebra or at the least fixed point of this equation, so this equation is a fixed point, then I would get A star as a solution. Whereas on this side, if I look at the greatest, then I get A star union A omega. And the reason I get A star as well is because I have nil, so I can terminate. But I can also get potentially infinite streams. And if I only want to get infinite streams, then I would just remove the nil, and I would have a times L as my data type. But what would be the least solution? Does anyone know? So if I take L to be just A times L, what would be the least solution? Anyone? Empty. Empty. Indeed. and A omega on this side. Okay? Okay, so let's put the table up there. Um, I'm going to define what a uh, functor is. So a functor is an operator that I'm calling f here that um, is defined over a category and for the purpose of this uh, lectures, I'm going to take the category of set. So the category of set is, has sets as objects, denoted by capital letters, like that. And I can um, link sets using total functions in a usual way. And what makes a category a category is that um, for every object, so for every set in this case, there is a special connection called, well, all these things are called arrows. There's a special arrow called the identity that is an arrow between one object and itself. And um, this arrow satisfies the following, okay, so point number one. So what makes a category a category is the existence of the identity and the fact that if I give you two arrows like this, one from x to y, one from y to z, then there exists an arrow between x and z that basically results from composing. So in the case of sets and functions, this is just function composition. So you don't need to really um, think much about it. So this is just function composition, and it um, 
satisfies properties like associativity. And it has this property that if I compose with the identity on X on the um, left or with the identity on Y on the right, uh, yes, Y, then this um, these two things, I mean, the identity should just really give me G, and in this case, should just give me F. Okay? So for the purposes of, um, of these lectures, we're going to be working on the category of sets and functions, so you don't really need to think about categories. Just think that capital letters are sets, and whenever I write... Um, an arrow between them is just a total function as usual, and total functions compose, and every set has um, an identity function. So when I write something like this, I'm just defining an operation over sets, and um, an operation is a functor if it's defined both on objects and on arrows as well. And it is such that when I apply it to function composition, then it should distribute. And when I apply it to the identity function, it should be the identity on f of x. So I said that every object comes with an, ident with an identity, so f of x in particular comes a, with an identity, so f of the identity arrow should just be identity on f. Okay, so this is the definition of functor. I know this might look a bit uh, abstract if you've never seen this before, but in fact you have seen this before, maybe not just um, in this abstract form, because a lot of the operations on sets that you're familiar with from discrete math are functors. So take, for instance, product, which um, was used in the previous lecture, and now this looks like an X. So if I have two sets, X and Y, and I take their Cartesian product, I can also talk about taking the Cartesian product of two functions. How do I do that? So if I have a function from, if I have f y, and I have g from z to w, then I can define the Cartesian product of two functions by saying that it is a function that just takes the pairing of both functions. So I take I just do the component wise application of the function. So this, the Cartesian product takes two sets, gives you two sets, sorry, takes two sets, gives you one set, and you can do a similar thing on um, functions. You can also do a similar thing on the disjoint union. So if I give you two sets and you take their disjoint union, that's also a functor on sets. And you can also define 
what the disjoint union of two functions is. By basically doing a case analysis, a case analysis on the argument, and depending on which side of the case analysis comes from, then you give the result. Another thing that is um, a functor is the constant functor. If you have a constant set, say b, you can define a constant functor by saying, okay, if I apply it to any set x, just return the set b, and if I apply it to a function f, what the, so if f is from x to y, then b of f should be from b of f, sorry, b of x to b of y. But that's that, that is just b, and that is just b. So actually, you could just define b of f to be the identity on b. And this is the identity, sorry, the constant functor b. So it's defined on objects as returning the set b itself, and on functions as the identity function on b. Now with these three example, with these three examples, we are now ready to define the functor that captures this fixed point equation I wrote here. I'm a bit confused. So you said B is the constant functor? Yeah. But then, so B takes a set X, so it should output X right now? No, so B, so B is a set. So given a set B. Wait, B is a set? Yeah, let me write, let me write. I know it's confusing, but uh, so given a fixed set B, sorry? No, there, uh, yes, there are two Bs. One is the name of the functor, and one is a set B. So I'm, I'm about to write the precise definition. So given a fixed set B, I'm going to define the constant functor as this. And if you want to really be very precise, you could give this a different name. Let's call it box B. So box B is the name. So it's what I call in this definition just F. And it's defined on any set X, so not a fixed set, but any set X as B itself. So it's always returning, it's like the constant function, right? It always returns a certain constant. And it's defined on arrows as the arrow identity of B. It's the identity, so it's because it's a function from B to B. So it's the um, identity arrow for the set B. So now I think there are squares in every place where it's used as a name. Sorry, I was using both, I was using B as both the functor name and the constant. Um, so previous uh, functor, uh, some functors, are those uh, going from set yeah. Yes, you are right. I I oversimplified a bit. Yes, they are going from set cross set to uh, set, which um, I could simplify in a different way and make them go from set to set. But yes, you are right.
another example of um, a functor that maybe you've seen is um, the functor that assigns to a set the set of its subsets. And on functions, this is defined as the um, direct image of F, namely um, it takes a subset of X, let's call it U, and returns a subset of Y by applying F to all U in U. Okay, so I see that I was a bit slower than I expected. So I'm just gonna do one thing. So if I define the functor f, one plus x, so it's the functor that either gives me nil or continues with x. If I would do this in, in OCaml, so if I would take a, a data type that either gives me nil or can do one construct x, what would I be defining? Can anyone guess? Natural numbers plus infinity. But if OCaml would have a flag that would allow you to do just the least fixed point, then uh, this would be defining just the natural numbers, okay? So there are several ways to look at this. So one way is to say, well, the natural numbers are actually an algebra for this functor. Namely, if I take f applied to the natural numbers, Sorry. Then there is an arrow from Fn to n that basically just tells me that zero is a natural number and successor is a natural number. So if I give you a natural number and you apply successor, then you have a natural number. So an algebra for a functor f is an arrow, oops, an algebra x for a functor x is just an arrow alpha from x, f, x to x. And a co-algebra is an arrow from x to fx. So an algebra takes a bunch of x's packed up 
using the functor f, and it builds a new x. A coalgebra takes an x and it destroys it into little pieces packed up in the functor f. Yeah, it's a constructor. But that's where things get a bit muddy in OCaml because you're, in essence, intuitively defining it as an algebra, but under the hood, OCaml is really computing a greatest fixed point, which, um, which goes more in the, in the direction of a co-algebra. But that's the, that's, the well, that's the beauty of fixed points, is because if you have a fixed point between fx and x, then you can go both ways. It's both an algebra and a co-algebra. Um, and this is where I'm going to stop today, but this is what we're going to spend the next lecture looking at which is um, some things are naturally defined as algebras, some things are naturally defined as co-algebras, but the objects for which you have such an isomorphism, and whether it's a um, least fixed point or a greatest fixed point, um, is what distinguishes what objects are naturally inductive from naturally co-inductive. And um, as I said, unfortunately in OCaml things are a bit mixed up, um, but I'm going to show you how to, how to know, of course you know this from the discrete math, but how it is that the natural numbers are an example of something that is naturally an algebra, a canonical algebra, namely the initial algebra, and how the natural numbers with the infinity are an example, not of an initial algebra, but of, of a final co-algebra. Uh, live in the same world, but at the same time have very distinct properties next time. Okay?